So uh, do pray for my father-in-law. Um, I guess I can say that since mine are the other five, of course, that would be in that category. Uh, but if you have your Bibles, go ahead and take them out. And with Jameson and Kristen gone and some of our other church members out, I felt like kind of doing double duty this morning. But when I asked Randy to lead singing, uh, Sheila looked like that was a bad idea. So, so uh, I'm grateful to get to be in the Lord's house. I hope you had a great Christmas. And uh, I know this is the day after. I do want to read a passage that some of you are very familiar with on Christmas Eve uh, with my dad and mom and, the, and, of course, our family. We read the Christmas story, which is a tradition in our house, with the family before we open presents out of Luke. Um, at home yesterday morning, we read, um, I believe, in Matthew. And so uh, this morning, I want us to go to Matthew. I think I may have said Luke, but I want you to go to Matthew with me, chapter 2. And that'll be our text. And this morning's message, I want to talk about uh, different responses, how people respond to Jesus, and what would be a proper response to Jesus Christ. And I bring this up because I hope you've taken advantage in the last few weeks of the fact that people in our country at least give lip service to Jesus during this time of year. I mean, even if you listen to a secular radio station, you're liable to hear Away in a Manger, or um, I've been really blessed multiple times. I think on AFR they've played the little Charlie Brown Christmas skit. I don't know if y'all have heard that played, but I just love hearing Linus tell Charlie Brown that's the real meaning of Christmas, Charlie Brown, you know, telling about the birth of our Lord. And so we're going to read what came after that, Matthew chapter 2, because the fact is a lot of people in our country will go back today, tomorrow, and live as if this baby in a manger is nothing more than a myth. We miss what Jesus is about if we're not careful and that is not uncommon. I think you even find that here on the very first nativity in the events following. It says in Matthew chapter 2 verse 1, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not thou the least among the princes of Judah? For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel." Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. So nice of him, huh? When they had heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeareth to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt. And be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and all the coasts thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men, then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, In Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted, because they are not. 
kind of a disturbing end to the Christmas nativity story. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we love you and praise you. God, I'm thankful for your word. And I pray that uh, this morning as we look at your word, that God, your Holy Spirit would have freedom to move. That, Lord, he would, um, Lord, touch our hearts. God, that we'd be challenged this morning, convicted. Lord, those of us that are your children. Lord, for my brothers and sisters in Christ that are here this morning, I pray that we'd be edified and encouraged and built up. Lord, help us be equipped for the work of the ministry that you've given us. God, I pray that if there's someone here that's never been saved, Lord, maybe they have resisted and rejected your Holy Spirit's conviction and they have never received this free gift of salvation. And I pray your Holy Spirit would do that work even this morning. And God, I just pray that, uh, Lord, above all, everything that we say and do, that you would be glorified and lifted up. And Lord, we're thankful for our church body. We pray for those that are out uh, with ailments. God, I am grateful for my church family, and I pray for those that have lost loved ones that had to go through holiday season, Lord, with an empty chair at the table. I pray that you'd comfort their hearts, give them peace, and ultimately, God, help us keep our eyes fixed on you through this season. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. amen. You can be seated. So if I was to ask you to kind of do some self-examination, how does the fact that Jesus has come into the world, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died and rose again, how does that actually practically impact your life? How, how has your life changed? What has been the reaction or the response personally to the fact that Jesus Christ, God with us, has come. Now, now I pray that the fact that you're here would indicate that you've received Jesus, that you have had a life. And by the way, a Christian, by definition, is somebody whose life has been changed by Jesus. Okay? I mean, there's many ways you could define that. But uh, you, if you're a child of God, if you've received Jesus, then, then I would pray that your response to not just this story, but your response to the Word of God would be one of reception, one of rejoicing in what God has done. And if I was to you know, try to maybe break this down and, and challenge us, it's important to note that a lot of people, at least there that night, if you go back to the story of the angels appearing to the shepherds, you know, and I love that story because those shepherds really were the first commissioned preachers of Jesus in the New Testament. I mean, if, if you look, they, they went, they found the child just like the angels said, and they went and they preached Jesus. They made a lot about Jesus. In Luke 2.20, you have that phrase that the shepherds went out and they were glorifying God. Do you know that it glorifies God when you tell people about Jesus? Um, last night it was Christmas, but we had a medical call. Had some of my firefighter buddies that I'm not sure if they know the Lord or not. And so before we broke up, I felt very prompted by the Holy Spirit of God to give a straight, clear gospel presentation to them. And it's not comfortable to do that. How many of you felt the Holy Spirit do that? And I just prayed and I said, how was y'all's Christmas? Oh man, we love Christmas. I said, you know, Christmas, we're kind of celebrating Jesus. And one of them kind of rolled his eyes. I said, I'm just saying that you better get to know him as Lord and Savior before you have to stand before him. I said, because one day, one day everybody will believe in Jesus. Amen? One day every knee will bow. But what a blessing to be counted with this group. This group of folks that you see that are very intentional at receiving and rejoicing in the coming Christ. The shepherds in Luke 2, 20. The wise men here in Matthew chapter 2. In verse 10 it says, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. When they saw the star, and listen, I've heard people talk about planets aligning and stuff like this. But if I read my Bible correctly, this was a very specific task oriented heavenly display a star that could literally lead them to the very place where Jesus laid right. amen that's what it says and so it because I've heard people say well last year we were supposed to have the star of Bethlehem do y'all remember that and the this two planets were supposed to align and create a mega bright star well I'm sorry but I stayed and watched the whole thing and they never aligned 
Not in Oklahoma. Do any of y'all remember that? There was always two. They got close, but they didn't merge. And then I heard somebody talking about some kind of heavenly thing going on uh, in the stars. Listen, I'm, I absolutely am convinced that Jesus made the stars. He put them in their places. God spoke the universe into existence. That's how big and awesome He is. And by the way, if He's big enough to do that, He's big enough to also personally know who you are. Amen? It takes a big God. God's big. And the Bible says that a specific star led them. So I wouldn't expect to necessarily see this again. I'm just saying. This seemed to be kind of a task-specific star. And it first takes them in the general vicinity. Jerusalem and Bethlehem are not that far away. They're both in Judah. And so they get generally close and they wind up going to see the king of the Jews. That was Herod's title. But they weren't looking for Herod. They were looking for one who had been born king of the Jews. And so these wise men from the east, when they get directed directly to Jesus, the Bible says they rejoiced. They gave. They worshiped Jesus. I believe maybe even through the prophet Jeremiah, maybe through Babylonian captivity, maybe through the spread of men like Daniel and the book of Jeremiah in a pagan Persian or Babylonian empire. I'm not sure how, but I'm convinced that some inspired gospel, word of God prophecy had made its way to wherever they were from. And they had gone on a specific search for Jesus. Do you know the Bible tells us we're commanded to seek the Lord? I saw a bumper sticker and it said, Wise men... Still seek Him. You know, you should seek the Lord. Do you know many people really have no meaningful encounter or walk with God? And the truth is, they don't really care to. They don't really care to. I, I've mentioned this, but I, I myself, uh, time before I was saved, struggled a little bit with skepticism. I've talked to skeptics. But many times when I witness to an atheist or a self-proclaimed agnostic or skeptic, many times it becomes apparent that the reason they can't find God is the same reason that a thief can't find a police officer. Amen? They don't want to find God. Uh, just the other night at prison, a, man, a young man that was there, not a Christian, skeptical young man, stayed and visited with me until finally a guard came and picked him up. A uh, young man's name was Corey, not a Christian. And as we began to talk, I said, wait a minute, Corey. I said, I need to ask you something. If God revealed to you that Jesus Christ was the way, the truth, and the life, the only way to heaven, would you follow him? Theoretically, if you could be convinced by God that he was... if you decided that you were going to seek truth, and I'm saying just assume that Jesus was who he says he was, would you follow him? And he goes, I'm not really sure I would. I said, then you may have a hard time finding Jesus. <laughs> Listen, many people will not seek God, and many people are not happy to receive Jesus. It amazes me that these wise men came from a far country to do what many of the local people could have, should have, but would not do. The wise men rejoiced with great joy. Not only that, do you know they presented to Jesus? And I do believe this. Uh, I understand that there was a fellow named Nicholas. When our kids were young, they, they've seen the legend of St. Nicholas. From a historical perspective, there was a real dude named Nicholas, and he was a giving man, and he was actually a... It seems to me like a God-fearing Christian man. And, you know, the legend grew and now we have Santa Claus, you know. But the, the interesting thing that I found when I went to Mexico is that they gave gifts. Now, it's evolving. I've heard now that Santa Claus has passed the wise men in Mexico. Rebecca, you probably know about this, but a lot of Mexican families would celebrate El Dia de los Reyes Magos. It was the day of the wise men. And that was a gift-giving time in honor of the story of these wise men. They not only sought Jesus, but when they worshipped him, they gave. Do you know that many times worship requires us to give of ourselves? By definition, when you worship, Jesus is the receiver. Jesus is the audience, not you. 
And that's important because I've heard people say, I didn't get much out of worship service. Well, good. We weren't worshiping you. <laughs> I mean, I hate to say that, but you know, we shouldn't have a consumer mentality and say, hey, I'm coming to, I, I want to I have some devotion time if I'll get something out of it. Well, do you know, you might want to get on your knees to give something to God. Not just to get something from God. And the Bible says these wise men, when they found Jesus, listen, it affected them. And unashamedly, they bowed before Him. They fell down and worshipped Him. Can I tell you something? They were not too proud to adjust their posture to worship Jesus. They fell down and worshipped Him. These wise men, these kings, these... I'm sure with the travel they had made and the title they're given, I'm sure that they probably were men of some means, yet they bowed before a baby. And they gave. They presented unto him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Those were very meaningful gifts, by the way. I have a question. What did you give Jesus this year? What do you give Jesus? What present... By the way, if we sing... I heard on the radio multiple times the last few weeks the little song where they've got little kids singing, Happy Birthday, Jesus. Y'all remember that song? We, we had some kids do it here one year. But what'd you get him? If it's his birthday, you may say, well, he's God, he doesn't need anything. But do you know that they actually he says there are certain things he wants? Did you know that? You know there are certain things that Jesus doesn't want. And there are certain things that he does want. The wise men gave him gifts. By the way, I believe their little trip to Egypt was probably funded by this gift of gold. I mean, let's be honest. Gold was valuable. Joseph and Mary had a baby. Diapers ain't cheap, amen? But I think they used that gift uh, probably wisely, and they, they needed those gifts. And, but those gifts had a significance to them. I think that the wise men were very thoughtful with what they gave Jesus. Do you know Romans 12, 1 and 2, the Bible says, Paul speaking, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present, that you give a present to God, that you present your body. Hey, if you're sitting there, reach over and pinch yourself. That body you're sitting in, this may be wild to you, but that's what Jesus wants. Your body. This is important because if you read Romans, and Romans 12 kind of starts the application part, but Romans, it, it, and Paul does this, he starts out with a lot of doctrinal what you need to know. He gets chapter 12, he's telling you what you're supposed to do about it. And in, and in Romans 12, he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice. That's a mouthful. A living sacrifice. Do you know that that means God does not want... One special holiday a year. Do you know he does not want a once a year birthday party? Right. He wants you to demonstrate daily holiness, not a once a year holiday. Amen? Do you know what else Jesus doesn't want? He doesn't want hollow, superficial lip service. The Bible says there's those that with their mouth they say they know me, but with their actions they deny me. The Bible warns us about lip service of saying things, of praising God with our mouth, but not affecting the way we live. He doesn't want lip service. He wants a lifestyle of daily sacrifice. That's what he says. He says that he wants us to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him, which is our reasonable service. That's just the right thing to do. So, if I was to ask you, if, if you're into giving and gift giving, did you give Jesus what he wanted? He doesn't just want your body, you know, to just have a sticker that says, I belong to Jesus, or wear a t-shirt that says, I love Jesus. When he says that your body is to be given to God, do you all understand that that's kind of a paradox? Because the Bible also says that our flesh is fallen I mean, our body's in a fight with our spirit. But if you're saved, you can yield this body as instruments of righteousness, according to Romans 6. You have to deny your flesh. But your flesh, because there's a heresy that, prop, that uh, had already cropped up in the New Testament, where people said, hey, the body's carnal, it's fleshly, it's material, it's evil. Forget it. 
this whole thing with, the, with God is just a spiritual thing, so it really doesn't matter what you do with your body. Do you know it does matter what we do with our body? It do, I've had people tell me, Clay, I haven't been to church, but I'm with you in spirit. That doesn't count. That doesn't count. We only count you if your body shows up. Amen? Amen. Do you know that to share the gospel, you have to use your mouth, which is a part of your body? Amen? Do you know to reach out and pat someone on the back or shake someone's hand to show up and to be the hands and feet of Christ, you might have to use your hands and feet. There are some of us that prayerfully, as believers, will receive Jesus the way he was received by those wise men. We will worship Jesus. We will give to Jesus. Last message I preached about Simeon. I don't know if y'all were here, but I preached about Simeon. The Bible says he was a just man. He had been justified by faith and he was devout. He was devoted to Jesus. And he got to hold the salvation of Israel in his hands. He was in the Word. He was in the house of God. But let me quickly move to really what caught my attention this week. That wasn't the only response Jesus had. The text that I read, because I kept reading, it went from joyous, wonderful, awesome, like my three favorite people in the nativity scene, the guys riding the camels. It goes from that to the massacre of the innocents very quickly, right? I mean, it moves from delightful to disturbing very quickly. It mentions Herod. Herod was a really bad man. Herod the Great, if you read history, you'll find that he was a man who was not opposed to violence. He had murdered at least one of his wives. I think he had a wife named Marianne or something like that. He had murdered her. He had two young men that occasionally would contend with each other and he believed would contend eventually with him for power. So he had them murdered. They were his two biological sons. I mean, Herod murdered the baby boys of Bethlehem and his wicked, demented, reprobate mind, he'd also murdered his own children. Bad man. Herod, this Herod, Herod the Great, he would be the father of the Herod that would behead John and kill Jesus. Remember when Pilate sent Jesus to Herod? That was Herod the Great's son. He's the grandfather of King Agrippa, who you find in Acts. I, I simply bring him up because when you read Matthew chapter 2, he's kind of prominently featured here. And he was troubled when he heard about Jesus. Do you know that some people don't rejoice over the Christmas story? Some people are not happy about Christmas because of the Christ in Christmas. Some people actually have an intolerant reaction or almost a spirit of angry retaliation as if Jesus himself is a very threat to their existence. That was Herod. Herod, listen, Jesus makes it clear in John chapter 3 when he was speaking to Nicodemus. Many, all of us know John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Do you know Jesus didn't stop at verse 16 though. He says, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. You know why Herod wanted Jesus dead? Because he was evil. His deeds were evil. Why did he hate the light? Because he loved the darkness. He killed the babies. This is not a light thing. It says in verse 16, When he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and all the coasts thereof. And by the way, this... I don't think we have to bring it up every time we talk about Christmas, but I don't want to wreck your nativity scene, but it does appear to me that the wise men shows up after the manger scene. The Bible says they were in a house. 
Now we know that the week after Jesus was born, they went to Jerusalem. That's where they saw Simeon and Anna. It appears to me that Joseph says to Mary, you know what? I've got roots in Bethlehem. I mean, we, there's some good folks in Bethlehem. We're going to get us, a, we're going to rent a house in Bethlehem. And we're not going back home until we're far enough removed from the birthday and the wedding date that people won't put a stigma on you. Because if you read people that knew Jesus and Mary and Joseph, do you know that some of those rulers really kind of put a backhanded insult? They said, we're not born of fornication to Jesus. They implied that he was. I think that there was some good reason that he stayed in Bethlehem. Now, it's possible that the star appeared before Jesus was even conceived. I mean, God knew what was going on. But it appears to me that the wise men shows up and Jesus is maybe a year old or he's a toddler. I don't believe Jesus was two. I think if Jesus was two, Herod would have killed everybody three and under. I think Herod was a devious demented, evil man, but he was covering all the bases. I think he expected Jesus to be around a year old, but just for safety, he killed everybody two years old and under. That's just my guess. He wanted the newborn Messiah, the rightful king of Israel, dead. And so he killed every boy baby that he could get to, not just in Bethlehem, but in the coast thereof. Do you know what that tells me? That tells me that it's very likely that those shepherds that rejoiced at the news and were telling people about Jesus, that within just a year or so of that joyous event, some of their lives would be altered forever as Rome would come in and violently slaughter their children. And I can't believe that it was just babies that died that day. I don't know any parents that would willingly let go of their baby. Rome, listen, if you were not a Roman citizen, Jewish life was less than human in a Roman's eyes. They were under no, listen, they were under no obligation to defend, protect the personal rights. There were no human rights if you were not Roman. In this culture, Roman citizens had rights. Everybody else were slave cultures and they were treated as such. Massacring the babies by Herod was no more of a big deal than killing the babies in Egypt was to Pharaoh. He was killing babies. And we read that, right? We all knew that story, but have you ever imagined putting yourself in that story? Because like, you think about it, if somebody like Jesus had such a miraculous birth, wouldn't there be more people following him and waiting for him and being excited when he shows up on the scene to be the Messiah. Well, do you know what? A lot of that joy and expectation probably got tempered or outright destroyed when outright traumatic tragedy struck in the form of Herod's slaughtering the innocents. I mean, he, he hated Jesus and he was willing to kill people. And by the way, do you know that if you ain't right with God, you're not going to be right with your neighbor? When you hate God, you're not going to be a loving and kind and compassionate husband or wife. When you have, are at war with God, you're not going to find peace with very many people either. See, Jesus, His existence was a threat. He was born King. He is Lord. And so you will either be excited and receive Him and rejoice, but that means that you come to Jesus and you bow before Him. He is Lord of all or He's not Lord at all. And the sad fact is many pagans have a better handle on Jesus' nature than some professing Christians. Let me repeat that. There are some anti-God pagans who have a better handle on the real identity and nature of God and Christ than some professing Christians. They don't, they don't like him because they, listen, they reject this word because they will tell you that this word seems to be authoritarian and oppressive. Can I tell you something? If Jesus is who he says he is, then he is Lord of all. He is the authority. Some Christians act like, no, no, it's just a, a story and a little emblem you get to wear and you get to have a really great life and it really doesn't affect anything else. No. If Jesus is who he says he is, it affects everything. And some people, rather than receive him, will react 
and reject Him. And that's heartbreaking, isn't it? You know, we, we enjoy singing Christmas hymns with Jesus in them. We enjoy. If you're a child of God, you know you enjoy hearing the Word of God preached. If you're really a believer in Christ. But can I point out that we've got neighbors and friends in our community that are lost that you couldn't drag them here. I mean, to listen to 30 or 40 or, if you're at Lindsay Chapel, an hour of Bible preaching would be like torture. Right? Not going to take it. Can't handle it. Don't want it. Listen, they have a problem with it. What's the difference? What's the difference? Well, first of all, if, if you're saved, the Holy Spirit of God resides in you. If you're one of Jesus' sheep, then you want to hear the voice of your shepherd. But listen, not everybody's sheep and a goat is not going to come to the good shepherd. And listen, Herod, this old goat, he wanted the shepherd killed. He wanted the king of the Jews killed because he could not continue to rule and reign if that which was born king of the Jews, that one, would be lord of all. Then Herod had to get rid of him. Listen, Jesus was Emmanuel, God with us. He was the Prince of Peace. Je uh, my dad's been preaching about names that Jesus was given. Isaiah prophesied that he would be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. But you know what else Jesus was? The Bible says he was a man of sorrows. He was acquainted with grief. I would imagine that Mary and Joseph had to have heard the word. That, hey, you know the angel told y'all to get out of here and y'all did? All them other babies, they were all killed. All, those, all the baby boys were killed. It's just tragic. Jesus had that effect on people, though. The Pharisees in Matthew chapter 21, verse 42 through 46, Jesus compares them... He uses the parable of the stone that the builders rejected. Some of y'all are familiar with that, but... In Matthew 21, in verse 42, not everybody loved Jesus. Not everybody was crazy about Jesus. The Bible says, Jesus said unto them, speaking about the, the Pharisees, the chief priests, did, not, did you never read in the Scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing and is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard these, his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitudes because they took him for a prophet. Do you know that when some people heard Jesus, like the, for example the Samaritan woman, the woman at the well, she heard Jesus, she ran back saying, Listen, come and see Jesus. And you know what the Pharisees did when they heard Jesus? How can we kill him without causing a fuss? It's amazing. But, and let me just point something out. I guess you could say that skepticism or having a problem with Jesus would be understandable when you look at some of the rank tragedy that some people went through, right? In America, it's a very common refrain when terrible things happen, how can there be a good God if bad things are happening? But do you understand that this Bible tells us, and may I just say that some of us have accepted a false notion of what reality is. You're being preached to all the time. The world's religion, America's official religion, the religion of secular humanism, implies that everybody deep down is really good. Do you know that that's not true? The Bible says that everybody deep down is a sinner. Right? But there's, there's other things that people believe that are wrong. For example, and I think it's bad teaching, bad uh, exposition of the Word of God to assume that if you get saved, everything will be rosy after that. 
Can I tell you something? Getting saved is the greatest thing in the world. Knowing that Jesus Christ, the one that made you and loved you and died for you, that he's offered you a gift that you've received by faith. Being saved is the only way to go. But can I tell you something? Paul said that if there was no resurrection, we of all people would be most miserable. Why? Because the Christian life is not promised in the Bible to be an easy one. But especially in this part of Oklahoma, I think sometimes we've been unintentionally affected by some of the messages from those that teach maybe a false word of faith type theology that says if you know how to believe right, you can create your own wonderful reality. Do you know that there are those teachers out there that will say that if you want everything rosy, you just have to learn how to believe right and you can have health and wealth and healing and anything you want. You just name it and claim it. And can I tell you something? God does want to give us good gifts. He is the giver of all good gifts. But Jesus said in this world you will have tribulation. You'll have trouble if you're a follower of Jesus. The Bible says you're going to be persecuted. If you line up with Jesus, you'll quit being as popular with the world as you might like to be. If you line up with Jesus. The world is not going to love you. Jesus said, listen, they're going to hate you. They hated me. When you do not approve of the world's Lifestyle, the world sin, when you, by your very lifestyle, can I just say this, that a lifestyle of holiness is an open rebuke to people living in compromise. No matter how loving and kind you are, a lifestyle of holiness is an open rebuke to people who are walking in compromise. And that's going to cause some people to be riled up at you. You say Jesus is the only way? People that don't believe in Jesus are going to label you intolerant. And there, listen, there are no, no people more intolerant than those that beat the drum the loudest for tolerance. That's right. You say Jesus is the only way, that is unacceptable. Saul, the Bible says in Acts chapter 9, verse 1, that he, was bree that he breathed out threatening and slaughter. He was a Pharisee. He was a guy that was memorizing the Bible. And when he heard about church services in Jerusalem, do you know what he thought about it? He was breathing out slaughter, the Bible says. People getting together. They're helping each other. They're singing and praising God. And they believe this guy, Jesus, is the Messiah. What do you think about that, Saul? I want to kill him. Will you let me kill him? Can I just go in and bust him up and haul him to jail and kill him? He was threatening and slaughtered. That's what he breathed, the Bible says. That's crazy, right? He was zealous against God. You know, I don't believe that there's anybody here that would fall into that category. There's no Herods here, I would hope. I would hope that there's nobody here that would say, Clay, I've heard the gospel and I will never submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ. I reject him and everything he's about. But you know, there's another response that is given to us. It's kind of skipped over many times. But there's a group of people that doesn't get much attention that to me are pretty significant. When Herod and the wise men, neither one really knew where to find Jesus. Do you know what the Bible says in verse 4 of chapter 2? He had gathered together the chief priests and the scribes of the people together. He demanded of them where Christ should be born. Do you know what he did? He called the church folks. He called the preachers and the Sunday school teachers. He called the scribes and the Pharisees. We give them a hard time now. But the Pharisees were the conservative, quote-unquote, Christians of the day. They were the religious people. He called them and asked, where was Jesus going to be born? Verse 5, and they said unto him in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written. These folks knew the Bible. This is what amazes me. Herod wanted to kill Jesus. The wise men wanted to find and worship Jesus. But the people who ought to have been the most expectant at receiving Jesus apparently are indifferent. 
I mean, it doesn't appear they're on Herod's team necessarily. I mean, listen, those scribes and Pharisees would have never approved of the massacre of innocent babies. No way. Right? We'd hope not. I mean, the scribes and Pharisees had political power inside the nation of Israel, but they had no Roman authority to execute anybody. Jesus was in no danger of the scribes and the Pharisees at this point in the story. Herod was the bad guy, make no mistake about that. The wise men, however, they get information from the people who knew the Bible better than they did. They knew the Messiah was going to be born. They weren't sure where. These folks actually knew the Bible. And so right after the wise men gave their gifts, these scribes and chief priests, they showed up and they praised God for the new Messiah too, didn't they? No, they didn't. Why not? Why didn't they? So I, I was asking some people this this week. Why, didn't you, don't, why don't you think the chief priests in Jerusalem, why they didn't just tag along and follow the wise men? Somebody said, well, they might not have believed it. You know, just because you know the Bible doesn't mean you necessarily believe it. I mean, I've had people that I've never seen in church and I've never heard talk religious. This last year, at least one example I remember very clearly, a guy mentioned to me, because of some particular mandates going on, he mentions to me, what do you think about the mark of the beast? I was like, I didn't know you were into the Bible. Well, I'm not really into the Bible, but I know how things wind up at the end. I said, you do? And he goes, yeah. I said, well, then which team are you going to be on? <laughs> I mean, you might think about getting to know Jesus now. I mean, it's good that you're scared of the beast, but why don't you get to know the Savior? Amen. Like, that's not just a one-sided story. This reference you're making would indicate to me that it's either the... Listen, you go look, read their last chapter. You're either on the team of the beast or the team of the lamb. Right? Listen, I can't imagine what it would have been like to be a, high, a, a priest or a scribe. They called a scribe in. This is just a student, Bible student. And they come and there's a group of them. And Herod says, hey, thank you, thank you fellas for coming in. Sorry to break you away from the Torah and the Jewish stuff. But these fellas are looking for the Messiah. Where would he be born at? And those kings from the east would say, the baby's been born, king of the Jews. Where can we find him? Well, that's, that's, in, that's neat. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. See, our Bibles tell us. Let's just flip back there. This is what our Bible says. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. That's where you can find him. All right, great. We've got gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We're going to worship him. Thank you. And by the way, there's been this heavenly star leading us, and it looks to me like it's taken us to Bethlehem, just like you said. Thank you. And they go, those were nice men. That's an interesting group. Toodaloo, bye-bye. What did they do? I don't know. This to me is probably the biggest crowd that you're going to deal with. Very few people in your life are going to say, hey, if you keep talking to Jesus, I'm going to cut your throat. There are countries where that's happening. But a lot of Americans are absolutely indifferent they may actually agree with you that Jesus is the Messiah, but it does not affect anything in their life. As far as I can tell, these scribes and Pharisees have the same mentality, the same posture 30 years later. Nothing changed. The fact that the Messiah had been born affected them in no functional way. Not at all. And so as I close today, I just want to say this. If someone was to look from a distance at you, can they see that Jesus actually has made an impact in your life? You see, you may not have an intolerant reaction to Jesus, but some of us have a very indifferent response when it comes to the practical details of our life. If Jesus is real, if He really died for me, then I should live for Him. If Jesus really loved me so much that He forgave me of my sin, then I should love Him and be willing to forgive others. 
Listen, many don't have room for the Christ of Christmas. There was no room in the inn. His birth today gets lost in the hubbub and the hectic lifestyle around us. Jesus has come. But so many of us are just in the in crowd. We're in the in crowd. We don't hate Jesus, but we just don't have room for him. His existence is questioned because some people around us are experiencing tragedy. Do you know what Matthew said, though? Matthew said that tragedy was prophesied. There's going to be nominal Christians in the coming days, in the coming years, that are going to fall by the wayside when the heat gets turned up and prophecy starts unfolding. Do you know that a COVID va- the COVID vaccine is not the mark of the beast? Some of you think, well, if it's a mandate, I'm going to lose my job if I don't get it. The, the COVID vaccine is not the mark of the beast. Amen, it's not. Some of you are like raising your eyebrows at me. (laughs) But can I just say this? You don't go from the land of liberty, home of the free, home of the brave, to mark of the beast with no steps in the middle. I mean, I'm saying that we should not be shocked if things are moving towards revelation. We should be shocked if they weren't. The baby's getting killed. Herod's wickedness did not defy God's plan. It was prophesied in God's plan. Now, it was a tragedy and it was bad. But it shouldn't have caused people to question God's word. It confirmed God's word. And when things keep going south, my Bible says that in the last days, things will get worse and worse. Things will get to be perilous times. I can't think of a better place to live, I mean this, than Oklahoma, smack dab middle of the United States of America, the greatest country in the world. I can't think of a better place to live. Amen? I I can't. I'm grateful to God for where he's put me. But we are in a world that will reject Jesus by and large. That's what the Bible says. The Bible references the church, Christians. It's going to be a remnant. It's going to be few. That's sad. It should not cause us to question God. It's a confirmation that God is exactly who He says He is. In the coming days, there may be times when things get hard. Do you realize that within driving distance of here, right now I was reading an article, there is a Canadian pastor who has been locked up for preaching the Bible. Another pastor, their church building is no longer theirs. It's been stolen from them by the government because they simply continued to meet. These are things that are happening very close to where we are. If prophecy unfolds, I would hope that you would be willing to not just be an indifferent bystander, but it would cause you to be committed to follow Christ even closer. Don't misrepresent Jesus' identity. He cannot be just a good teacher. He will not just be another religious leader. He will not be a token or simply a symbol. Jesus Christ has to be your Lord and Savior. I'm going to ask Megan to come to the piano. In this room today, I don't believe anybody would stand up and say, that second group you talked about, that's me. I just really hate believers. I mean, it's a free country. You wouldn't be here if that was your mentality. But how many of us, by the lives we live fall into the more indifferent, it doesn't really affect me category than the intentional receiving of Jesus. John chapter 1, the Bible says that he was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. He came unto his own and his own received him not. Isn't that sad? Some of them just hatefully rejected him. Some people just ignored him. He came into his own and his own received him not, but to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. You're either a son of God, you're either a child of God, you're either saved or you're lost and you need Jesus. I'd like you to stand with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. 
In Matthew 16, verses 13 through 17, Jesus asked His disciples, Who do you say that I am? What's your response to Jesus? Is He your Lord? Oh, can I just tell you, He loves you. I, I, without a doubt, I am convinced that I can promise you this morning that Jesus loves you, He died for you, and He will save you if you're lost. Do you need to be saved? And then let me, let me ask you this. If you'd say, Brother Clay, I'm saved. I'm a Christian. I've received Jesus. But is He Lord? You know what rebellion is in a Christian's life? Rebellion is when you have a little area in your life that you refuse to let Jesus be Lord of. By your actions... Are you questioning the motives of a good God? Some will go the other way in anger. Some will choose to follow Jesus. Some people will just be indifferent. You willing to follow Jesus? Some are at the altars if you need to come. We're not going to go on long, but this is an opportunity that if you need to talk to someone, you can come and the pastor will meet you right here, share with you how you can be saved. Do you need to come? As long as there's people at the altars, we're not going to interrupt that, but this might be your verse. We're going to sing one verse of this with Megan playing. We're going to sing, I have decided to follow you. You don't need a book, but let's sing this before we close. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Amen. Praise the Lord. Pastor Clay, thank you. Powerful message and very thought-provoking, isn't it? We would study the Word of God and just, just get out of the Word of God what He wants us uh, to receive. It's such a blessing having you all this morning. Look forward to seeing you tonight at 6 o'clock. I get to preach. I want to um, give you a little bit of salt on your oats so you'll uh, kind of be thirsty for tonight. If somebody were to ask you, do you love God? Uh, and I've done my own little survey. Uh, I've asked a lot of people, do you love God? And I've yet to have a person that looked me in the face and says, no, I do not love God. The answer is almost always yes. And so uh, I think Clay read some of my notes. Uh, and so this evening we're going to talk about how can you know that you love God? How can you know that you love God? And... Um, I think you'll be really surprised at the answer. I want to ask my brother Steve Turner, if you will, to make your way up here and dismiss us. And uh, I hope you had a great, great Christmas, a Merry Christmas, uh, making much of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you so much for allowing us to come to church this morning to hear your word. And Father, may we apply it to our lives as we go out through this week. Father, I thank you for our pastors and all the Sunday school teachers that we have. Uh, Father, delivering the word to us straight from the Bible. Father, I just appreciate that so very much. I ask that you'd watch and care over all the sick and afflicted on our prayer list, Father. And I pray that you would take care of those that are hurt and have troubles, that they can seek one of us maybe or seek you and get the answers, that we could help them, Father, in a way that you could help them. Father, I just thank you for all these people that are here today, all the families represented. Father, I just love you so much. We all love you so very much. Lead us and guide us, who will be careful to give you the praise in the name of Jesus. Amen.